He grew up so poor that he didn't know what three meals a day felt like until he joined the army. He was one of 15 children, and he spoke with a thick European accent, even though he was born in rural Pennsylvania. His name was Charles Dennis Bukinski, but the world would come to know him as Charles Bronson, one of the iconic film stars and legendary tough guys of the 20th century. He lived a life of faith, perseverance, patriotism, and stoic individualism that he would come to personify on the big screen. This is his amazing story. Since the days of the first talkies, some of Hollywood's biggest and most bankable stars have been the tough guys, the heroes, and sometimes anti-heroes that exuded a certain rugged machismo that captured the hearts of women and the respect of men. There are two types of big screen heroes, a famous Hollywood producer once observed, those that are acting and those that are real. Audiences can always tell the difference. Hollywood immortality was the furthest thing on young Charles Bukinski's mind as his family toiled through the Great Depression in the impoverished Allegheny Mountains region north of Johnston, Pennsylvania, a rural coal mining town where seemingly everyone worked underground. It was backbreaking, difficult, and dangerous work, and by the time he was a teenager, Charles had joined his siblings in spending what free time he had, pulling coal from the earth to help support their large family. Coal mining country was the type of place where few ever made it out. It was assumed that the townsmen would spend their lives working the mines during the week and tending to their family and faith on the weekends, a simple and not uncommon existence throughout rural America during the 1920s and 30s. That certainly would have been the case for young Charles. He was already spending time working in the coal mines before and after school, but duty called following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. With his thick European accent and hard to pronounce last name, Bukinski had something else to prove, that he was as devoted to his country as anyone else, even more so. Shortly after his 20th birthday, Charles joined the United States Army Air Force. He never regretted it for a moment. He would recall years later, he was proud to serve his country. Charles was sent to the gunnery school at the 760th Flexible Gunnery Training in Kingman, Arizona, where by all accounts he excelled as a gunner. After training, he was assigned to the Guam-based 61st Bombardment Squadron within the 39th Bombardment Group, where he served as a gunner on a B-29 Superfortress. Army Air Force buddies recalled him as quiet, stoic, a man of few words, but when he spoke, he meant it. Reliable, dependable, and tough was the way one of his crewmates would describe him. If you gave him a task, you could count on it getting done. He was also known for coming to the defense of his crewmates when things got rowdy on the base, especially if he felt like they were being bullied or harassed when their provincial upbringing showed. You didn't want to get on the wrong side of Charlie, that's for sure, remembered a crew member. If you did, you had better be prepared for a beating. Buczynski would fly a total of 25 missions on the B-29, most of them targeting mainland Japan. They were risky assignments as the Japanese fiercely defended their homeland. It was during a bombing run over the critical Hotagaya chemical plant when Corporal Buczynski was riddled with machine gun fire as the bomber approached the target. Bleeding profusely, Charles refused aid and remained at his gun, fighting off an onslaught of fighters as the bombs nailed the target. He barely survived the flight home and was awarded the Purple Heart for his heroics that day. The guy was pure guts, plain and simple. Nothing phony about him, said his good friend Donald Pleasance, who starred with him in The Great Escape and was also a decorated war hero. With an honorable discharge from the military, Charles took advantage of the GI Bill to study art and acting. He knew little about either, but knew that both were preferable to returning to the coal mines of Pennsylvania. I wasn't an artist by nature, he would reminisce years later. I just thought it was a better way to make a living than working underground the rest of my life. With his broad shoulders, chiseled jaw, and imposing persona, it wasn't long before Bukinski started receiving bit parts here and there with his first real taste of Hollywood notoriety coming in the Vincent Price classic House of Wax, where he played a memorable deaf mute named Igor. Still billed as Charles Bukinski, his agent convinced him to shorten his name to Bronson so that he wouldn't attract the attention of anti-communist crusaders in the House and Senate 
who might be confused by his European-sounding name and accent. Newly named Charles Bronson would be one of the busiest character actors throughout the 1950s, playing an assortment of heels, tough guys, enforcers, and even the occasional stoic frontiersman. He wasn't a household name, but the steady work allowed him to hone his craft and pay the rent, earning a comfortable living far from the coal mines of Pennsylvania. That would all change when he was cast by famed director John Sturgis in the 1960 classic The Magnificent Seven, starring Hollywood heavyweight Yul Brynner and a cast of up-and-coming actors, including a hot-tempered television star named Steve McQueen. With the constant feuding between Brynner and McQueen over screen time, Sturgis was impressed with how Bronson helped keep the peace by giving a few of his lines to McQueen to keep him from torpedoing the production. Sturgis was so impressed that he cast Bronson in the role of Danny the Tunnel King in The Great Escape a few years later, which would go on to be one of the highest grossing movies of the 1960s. Though Steve McQueen and James Garner had higher billing, it was a breakout role for Bronson and set him on a path towards Hollywood superstardom. People think The Magnificent Seven changed by career, and it did in a way, but it was the great escape that truly altered my life, said Bronson in an interview he gave shortly before passing. John Sturgis believed in me when nobody else did. On the heels of The Great Escape, Bronson would become one of the busiest film and television actors throughout the 1960s. Perhaps his most memorable role of the decade came in The Dirty Dozen, another World War II classic with an iconic ensemble cast. He bonded with the movie's star, Lee Marvin, who, like Bronson, had received a Purple Heart for his service during World War II. Charlie and I never spoke of our experiences during the war, but there was a shared understanding, said Lee Marvin, in one of the few interviews he ever gave about his wartime heroics. Bronson remained as busy as ever throughout the late 60s and early 1970s, and by 1973 was the highest paid actor in Hollywood, earning $1 million per film. He was a long way from coal country Pennsylvania, though he never lived the lavish lifestyle that many stars succumb to. Bronson's most memorable role would be as architect-turned-vigilante Paul Kersey in the Death Wish series, based on the novel by Brian Garfield. At a time when crime and lawlessness was on the rise across America, audiences flocked to the Death Wish movies to see Bronson's anti-hero administer justice as the unrepentant judge, jury, and executioner of street crime in New York and Los Angeles. Death Wish brought Bronson international acclaim as he became the most bankable star throughout the 1970s. He was no longer just a leading man and box office gold. He was now a bona fide movie star. Through all the success, accolades, and riches, Charles Bronson remained grounded, never partaking in the Hollywood lifestyle that trapped so many stars of the day. He and his wife, the actress Jill Ireland, lived a quiet, simple life away from the movie set and spent much of their time together, starring in 16 films with each other. One of the great Hollywood romances, on par with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, that was tragically cut short when Jill died from breast cancer in 1990 at the age of 54. Though he would continue on with his acting career, Bronson was never the same following the death of his beloved Jill. A spark left him when Jill died, said his good friend James Garner. I think a piece of him died with her. Charles kept his hand in acting after Jill's passing, though his heart wasn't quite in it. Towards his 80th birthday, he began slowing down with the onset of Alzheimer's. Charles Bronson passed away in 2003 at the age of 81. He was buried in Vermont, where he and Jill spent most of their time, her ashes interred with him. His gravestone makes no mention of his career in Hollywood, just that he was a cherished husband and father. But beneath that are the lines from Claire Harner's 1934 poem, Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not here, I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond's glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the autumn's gentle rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not here, I did not die.